It's my pleasure um, to, to welcome you all this evening uh, to the uh, uh, November 5th presentation uh, uh, presented by the Springfield Township Historical Society. Uh, my name is Scott Krylik. I'm president of, this, of the Historical Society um, and we're pleased to welcome you. Um, our speaker this evening uh, is uh, Mr. Ronald Slotto, uh, research professor of earth and space sciences at Westchester University and author of several books, including the 2019 self-published book, The Mines and Minerals of Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Um, Ron worked for 41 years for the US Geological Survey before he began research at Westchester University. Uh, in, in his books, which also include the mines and minerals of Berks County and the mines and minerals of Chester County, uh, Ron put together his interest in mineralogy, uh, history and geology in one place. While working on the books, he was able to explore some mines and quarries while others are gone. According to Ron, the quarries are being filled in and built on. Corson's Quarry in Plymouth Meeting still operates one, while another has been built on and another is being filled in to be built on. Montgomery County once produced sandstone, building stone, marble, and iron. Quarries in Springfield Township included a stone quarry with iron ore deposits at the northwest corner of Walnut Avenue and Orland Mill Road in Orland, where Sandy Run Park is now located. Living in Orland, I, I'm particularly interested in hearing more about uh, that area. Um, in the 1950s, crushed limestone, riprap, road material, and railroad ballast were produced by the quarry. It flooded during a spring snowstorm that knocked out power, shut down pumps, and submerged the quarry. It was purchased by the U.S. Navy in the early 1960s for underwater sonar testing, and the site was known as the U.S. Deep Water Facility. Springfield Township accepted ownership of the site from the United States Department of the Interior in 1999, and open the 14 acre Sandy Run Park. So this, uh, this program was uh, postponed earlier um, due to COVID uh, and we're, we're very pleased to, uh, to welcome Ron uh, this evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you all had a chance to enjoy the uh, beautiful day today. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking about the mineral industries of mostly uh, Southern Montgomery County. Um, Mineral industries present and past include the production of lime, iron ore, and iron, uh, marble, uh, refractories, which I'll explain what they are later, asbestos products, building stone, crushed stone, bricks, lead ore, and copper ore. And today the only mineral industry that's really active is just the uh, crushed stone um, industry. Uh, first, we need to take a look at the geology of Montgomery County. Um, about 80% of Montgomery County is underlain by um, Triassic Age sedimentary rocks. Uh, these rocks are very old. Uh, they're about uh, 200 to 250 million years old. Uh, they're intruded by uh, an igneous rock, which is in the red here, diabase, which got squeezed into the uh, rock layers as molten lava. Um, down here at the very bottom, uh, this white area is the uh, White Marsh Chester Valley that's underlain by carbonate rocks, uh, limestones and dolomites. Um, above it and below it um, are some quartzites and the very bottom of the county in green are uh, very old metamorphic rocks that are about um, half a billion years old or uh, older. Uh, the types of industries that uh, occur um, are very much dependent upon the uh, geology. The oldest mineral industry is the lime industry. Uh, that began about 1685 in White Marsh Township. That was well before the uh, Revolutionary War. And that was started by a woman uh, by the name of Madam Farmer. Uh, in the county, you could get either wood burnt or coal burnt uh, lime. It was sold by the bushel, uh, generally at the uh, quarry um, in the beginning. Uh, some of the quarry operators would trade uh, wood um, for lime to get enough wood to make their uh, lime. 
Uh, as time went on, there were several major centers of lime production, uh, and they are Port Kennedy, Bridgeport, and Plymouth Meeting, where lime was manufactured and sold on a large scale. Uh, lime was shipped along the East Coast by rail and water uh, to New Jersey, New York, Delaware, and Maryland. Um, the last lime producer in the county was the Course and Lime Company that uh, went out of business, or I should say they shut their kilns off in uh, 1997, um, we, <laughs> which is kind of interesting to me. You have an industry that went on, uh, and it, at times was a major industry, for almost 300 years. And when it ended in 1997, nobody noticed. Uh, cement was also manufactured at uh, one location in Montgomery County. Uh, this is a map of the quarries in Valley Forge National Park uh, from 1912. Port Kennedy, um, which is located along the river, uh, was a major center of lime production. Um, a guy by the name of John Kennedy, an immigrant from um, Ireland, uh, purchased uh, several plots of land uh, in this area, set up a uh, a lot of lime kilns. I think he owned about 14 at one time uh, and had a rather thriving business. Um, at one point there was a railroad that actually ran along the uh, quarries to collect the stone to take to the kilns in Port Kennedy. Uh, Port Kennedy, um, now if you go on Route 422 uh, towards King of Prussia, uh, you will pass on one side the Kennedy Mansion, on the other side a church and a cemetery. Uh, that was Port Kennedy. Uh, it no longer exists. Uh, when the uh, state uh, took over Valley Forge uh, Park, they decided to erase everything that occurred after the Revolutionary War, and that included the village of Port Kennedy. Uh, they condemned the houses, uh, and they bulldozed them, and started filling the quarries, destroying the kilns, and pretty much obliterating um, the history of uh, wine production in Port Kennedy. This is the John Kennedy Quarry. It's right below the visitor center. It's a parking lot, has a few picnic tables in it. And what looks like rock outcrops along the uh, parking lot are actually the sides of the uh, Kennedy Quarry. Kennedy built a mansion um, known as Kenhorst in 1852. It's on uh, a hill that overlooks Port Kennedy on one side or what used to be Port Kennedy, and um, Valley Forge National Park on the other side. I think the uh, federal government owns the um, mansion right now. Uh, inside is elaborate plaster work uh, that was designed to show off some of the things that could be done with uh, lime products from Kennedy's quarry. Another uh, large lime producer was William Moji and company. Um, in Plymouth Township. Uh, they are just south of the uh, Norristown um, border. Um, he operated a limestone quarry with 23 lime kilns. Uh, he shipped uh, by water um, all up and down the East Coast. Um, here's one of the ads that he placed in a Wilmington, uh, Delaware newspaper. Um, and he would ship by water uh, lime all the way down to uh, Wilmington. Um, his workers um, lived in a uh, company town called uh, Mochi Town. Um, there were 60 tenant houses in there, a church um, and other buildings. Um, Moji went out of business about 1868 um, and um, the properties were divided up and sold to the individual tenants. The Corson Lime Company um, started in 1838 when George Corson partnered with his nephew Elias Corson. Corson. They purchased the Mul 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 yeah, Mulsby Estate, uh, where there were quarries and lime kilns that operate as early as 1798. Um, they had a very brisk business. Uh, it lasted until 1997 when the quarry where the quarry and the whole business was sold to an outside uh, company 
who wanted to quarry crushed stone and was not interested in the production of lime, so they shut down the uh, lime kilns. Um, what's interesting is in, in 1870, there was a steam, um, well, it was started out as a horse-drawn railroad. So you had a ho horse pulling coal from Conchahokan up to the course and kilns in the morning, and then the horse would pull the same car, load it with lime back down to Conchahokan in the afternoon. And eventually that was replaced with a, a steam railroad in um, 1870. At one time, there were quite a few lime kilns um, around Montgomery County, and uh, most of them have disappeared, um, erased by urbanization. Um, these are two kilns that are in Plymouth Meeting. They were slated to be demolished by a road widening uh, project, but the uh, Plymouth Township Historical Society stepped in and saved them and restored them. Uh, right around the corner uh, from there is the Leadham Line Kiln. Uh, the plan for development by the property owner called for destroying this line kiln. Um, it's been a few years since I've been there, so it may or may not still be standing. And one other lime kiln I was able to find in Montgomery County, and that's in the village of Ernst, which is about halfway between Norristown and Conchahokan. And this, uh, these, this is the uh, Septa Railroad tracks, uh, which are between the Schuylkill River and the lime kiln. You can probably see it from the railroad, um, but it's kind of uh, hard to find otherwise. It's in a, a rather out of the uh, way place. There was one place in the county that produced cement, and that was the Valley Forge Cement Company. Um, it produced Portland cement. The first shipment from the plant was made on July 30th, 1928. Uh, the plant was owned and operated by Lieutenant Colonel James W. Fuller Jr who was a rather prominent uh, person in the cement industry in the Allentown area. Um, he financed and built this plant, um, took a vacation to Hawaii, came down with sleeping sickness and passed away less than a year later. Um, I'm not sure how long this plant operated. I just couldn't turn up the uh, ending date for it. They operated two quarries. There's a quarry here and a quarry there. Uh, the stone was taken down to the plant, converted to cement. Um, this is the Schuylkill River right here uh, in River Road to uh, orient you to where this is at. Uh, the quarries of West Conchahokan have produced some beautiful minerals. Um, this is calcite. Um, I've been a mineral collector since the age of five, so I always like to throw in a few uh, uh, beautiful mineral, mineral specimens that uh, the county has produced. Um, just up the road in Bridgeport, uh, this green mineral is malachite, um, which in places was mined as an ore of copper. And associated with that are some uh, very beautiful, clear quartz crystals. And this from Moji, uh, probably the area of the uh, Moji uh, lime quarry. On the inside, you have a nice agate. And on the outside, it's just covered with beautiful quartz crystals. Iron was produced between 1840 and 1900 in Montgomery County. And the reason why it took until 1840 to start manufacturing iron is because it kind of waited until the uh, railroad was constructed along the Schuylkill River to bring anthracite coal from the coal fields um, down to the Conchahokan area. Uh, the day of the charcoal furnace had long passed all the furnaces were operating on anthracite coal as a fuel. And once uh, they could get their hands on the anthracite coal, they began to build uh, iron furnaces. The iron ore came from local deposits, which were generally pretty shallow in residual clay in the uh, carbonate rocks of the uh, Chester uh, White Marsh Valley. Uh, limonite and gothite were the major ores that were smelted. The first iron furnace was the spring mill furnace, which was built in 1844. 
Uh, 12 years later, there was nine furnaces in operation. The heyday uh, was in the 1870s uh, when there were 14 iron furnaces in operation. But you notice the 14 furnaces only produced 103,000 uh, tons of pig iron in one year, which is not a whole lot. Uh, by 1900, the furnaces were all abandoned and gone. Uh, that was due to uh, two things. Uh, one, um, most of the iron industry went to major centers like uh, Carnegie's U.S. Steel in uh, Pittsburgh, which uh, was just a major iron producer and these small furnaces couldn't compete with it. And the mines were driven out of business by cheap iron ore from Lake Superior. Um, I know uh, the French Creek mine, which is close to my house, uh, they could actually, the Brook Brothers could actually buy iron ore from Lake Superior cheaper than they could mine it from their own mine and take it on their own railroad to their, their, to their furnace. So they shut the mine down. Because of that, most of the other mines in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania uh, were abandoned uh, before 1900. I, I'm always looking for old photographs that I can uh, use in my uh, books and presentations. I tried to find some photos of some of the old iron um, smelters. Uh, I could not uh, turn any up, but I did find this letterhead. Uh, it's dated 1871. that shows the uh, Plymouth Iron Works in uh, Conshohocken. Uh, there's also another um, iron works, the Edge Hill Iron Company. Um, they were incorporated in 1867. They actually had their mines in Springfield Township, although their iron furnace was just across the uh, border in, um, in Abington. Uh, their mines are located on um, southwest of the intersection of Pennsylvania and North Hills Avenue on the North Hills Country Club property. Um, they're really not very obvious, but if you use uh, LIDAR imagery, uh, you can see two large open pit uh, excavations. There were a number of iron mines in the Five Points um, area of Springfield Township. Uh, this is the map from 1877. You can see several iron mines um, on the map. Joseph Eagle's property, iron ore and fire clay, Charles Eagle, iron ore. Um, Stinson, McGuire and Company were um, iron ore again, a mining company, Hitner and McGuire. Uh, they were a mining company, um, iron ore here. Um, I tried to find out some information about these mines, but they just don't seem to be available. Uh, there's little bits and pieces of information in the 1880 census that uh, talk about uh, who operated some of these mines, how much they mined during a one year period and where the ore was uh, sent. 1893, a map also shows um, iron ore here on the Charles Eagle property, um, McGuire and Stinson iron ore, and interesting, Bethlehem Iron Company owned a large chunk of property um, in Five Points in 1893. Uh, but again, I couldn't find out any information about whether they were mining there or um, what exactly they were doing. Uh, the up here, I guess, um, was also known as the Enfield Farm. On uh, the last, uh, let's see if I can go back. Um, here it says iron ore and fire clay. Uh, those, after the mining was uh, ended, um, Joseph Allen purchased the property and started a pottery and uh, he dug clay from the iron ore pits and uh, used them in his uh, pottery business. Um, he started that about 1906 and um, had quite a successful pottery for a number of years. Uh, the clay was also used for furnace linings um, by some of the iron uh, furnaces. This is a map of Upper Marion Township from 1896. Um, there's a number of iron mines. Um, they're just scattered all over the place here. 
Uh, again, it, it was very difficult to, uh, to get information about these um, iron mines. Uh, the property owners did not do any of the mining. Uh, what they did was to lease out their property to others to mine. And um, in some cases, uh, several um, leases in different parts of their property. You can see a railroad was built from the mines to take the ore to the um, iron furnace that was in West Conchahawken. Uh, Matsunk uh, was the uh, name of West Conchahawken before the borough was incorporated. Uh, most of these were rather shallow deposits. Uh, again, residual iron deposits in uh, limestones. Uh, they were not um, very large. They were not very uh, productive. Uh, if you had uh, good ore, you had uh, two parts iron ore to one part dirt. If you had not so good iron ore, you had one part iron ore to two or three parts dirt. Uh, and that's how they gauged um, how good the uh, ore deposits were. Uh, this is what one of the, um, what some of the iron ore from Marion, Upper Marion Township looked like. This is a specimen of uh, gothite. Uh, this is another specimen of gothite. It's sort of hollow looking uh, geode. Uh, it uh, was called bombshell ore because um, I guess Bombs in those days were well, made out of iron. They were hollow and filled with powder and uh, these resembled them quite a bit. Uh, from Orland, uh, there was a nice iron deposit there um, in Springfield Township. Uh, some of the girthite from there and a couple of more uh, specimens. You can actually go and uh, collect uh, girthite. It's um, um, the location is given in my book. It's uh, a stream channel that's dry most of the time and you can walk up this uh, stream cha channel and uh, pick up pieces of this, um, this iron ore. Uh, okay, this is a 1938 um, aerial photograph from the Marble Hall um, area. To get you orient or orientated. Um, this road here is Germantown Pike that runs uh, northwest southeast. This road here is a Joshua Road that runs northeast southwest. And there's three features I'd like to point out. Uh, this round one here is the Hitner Iron Mine. Uh, this building here was the Hitner Mansion. And this long skinny quarry was the Hitner Marble Quarry. Uh, this is known as Miles Park today. Um, the iron mine's gone, the mansion's gone. Uh, the quarry is still here. It's still on the golf course, which is still a, an operating golf course. Uh, this is the, uh, I don't have a date for this photograph, but this is what the Hitner iron mine looked like uh, after mining was done, it flooded and it was used as a swimming hole uh, by uh, the local residents. It's called Donovan's Quarry. Uh, why it was called Donovan's Quarry, I've never found that out. Uh, but it was a very popular swimming hole until someone drowned in it and the township filled it in and uh, made it disappear. Uh, it was much as uh, 50 feet uh, deep. The township inher inherited uh, this piece of property um, in the late 1940s, uh, radio step station WFIL wanted to erect a few uh, radio antennas um, on the uh, property, uh, which was against zoning. So they um, made a deal with the township. We'll give you 10 acres of this property if you let us erect our towers. And the township said, okay. And they wound up with um, Hitner's iron mine and Hitner's uh, mansion. Marble was a huge industry in, uh, in Montgomery County. Whoops. Um, before 1840, um, quarries started about mid 1700s. And uh, there were a number of quarries in Upper Marion and White Marsh. Uh, they supplied building stone uh, to Philadelphia mainly. Many of the public buildings in Philadelphia were constructed of uh, Montgomery County marble. This is the Hitner Marble Quarry. I showed you on the aerial photograph. Very long, very skinny. And from side to side, 
I have to learn how to click side to side. This is maybe 35 or 40 feet wide, uh, not very wide, but it's over 300 feet deep. So if you can imagine that something 35 feet wide at the surface going down 300 feet, uh, they followed a, a very good uh, vein of white marble. And uh, by the time they got down to 300 feet, it was getting nearly impossible to pump the water out of the quarry and to uh, get the marble out. So they uh, abandoned it. Uh, this is a chunk of the marble uh, that's lying on the golf course that came out of there. Uh, most of the marble it produced was nice white marble. Uh, some of it was a, a pink uh, and gray marble. Um, and some of it was a gray marble with uh, white streaks um, in it. Uh, this is the Hitner uh, mansion. It was um, built of marble from Hitner's quarry. It was uh, three stories, had 20 inch thick walls of solid marble, 21 rooms, uh, 14 fireplaces, fireplace uh, in every, uh, oh, 14 foot ceilings, a fireplace in every room with marble mantelpieces, marble floors, marble doorways, marble window sills, a marble floored uh, porch uh, that ran uh, all the way around the building. Um, very impressive hand carved marble staircase edged with black marble railings. Um, it was torn down by the uh, township in uh, 1949, so <laughs> it's no longer there, but it sounded like uh, quite the building. One of the buildings that was built with marble from Montgomery County was Gerard College in Philadelphia. Another was the Second Bank of the United States. Uh, this photo dates to uh, 1939. If you look at the columns, which are made from marble from Montgomery County, they're not looking um, too good. Uh, and there's two reasons for this. Uh, one is you have acid air um, in cities and that tends to react with limestone, acid and base and to corrode the limestone. So it's uh, very tough for limestone buildings in an urban environment. And the other is that there were very small amounts of the mineral pyrite um, in the marble. Pyrite is iron sulfide. And when you got it wet, it weathered. Uh, the iron combined with the oxygen uh, to form um, iron oxide, rust. And the sulfur uh, combined with the water to form sulfuric acid, uh, which then ate uh, the marble away. So um, hence the deterioration in uh, some of these marble buildings. There are two marble stones made with marble from Hitner's quarries in the Washington Monument. Um, this one is a stone uh, that commemorates the state of Pennsylvania. And these stones were furnished about 1855 uh, when they were building the monument. And this more elaborate stone uh, made of Hitner marble uh, commemorates the Association of Journeymen Stonecutters of Philadelphia. Uh, another large marble quarry was just up the street from the Hitner Quarry. Uh, this was known as the Potts Marble Quarry, which was operated by the uh, Potts family for uh, many, many years. Um, it's located west of Cedar Grove Road and south of Butler Pike. It's on the, um, uh, the Sherry Lake, it's called Sherry Lake, uh, its current name around the Sherry Lake Apartments. Uh, was also known by um, a lot of different other names over the years, the Wilkinson Quarry, the Dagger Quarry, the Hocker Quarry, the Cedar Grove Quarry, and um, now it's just known as Sherry Lake. Um, when they could no longer ship marble by rail um, from Conshohocken, uh, they went out of business. That was about 1890. Uh, one other quarry I'll mention is the Schweier and Lees uh, Marble Quarry in King of Prussia. Um, this photo from 1929, you could see the beautiful white marble. And this was cut into blocks by channeling machines, uh, which uh, went along and made straight uh, deep cuts uh, in the marble so it could be broken out in uh, nice blocks. 
this, these, there were two quarries, uh, both square shaped. Um, and they were fairly deep, a couple of hundred feet. Uh, they were filled in and built over and uh, all trace of them are gone today. There's a veterinarian office um, near one of them. And I stopped in there and they had no idea that there was ever a quarry um, on their property. Uh, this is a um, explanation what refractories are. Uh, they're basically um, materials that could stand high heat that were used in the linings of industrial furnaces and kilns. Uh, so they could take all the heat the furnaces could uh, produce. Uh, eventually, uh, they had to be replaced, but they were probably about the uh, the strongest, best thing you could use to line furnaces with. And there were a number of quarries in Montgomery County that produced uh, refractory uh, materials. Uh, those came out of the quartzites, uh, which are north and south of the limestone valley. Uh, this is one of the uh, quarries, the Edge Hill Silica Rock Company. You can see the beds of the rock are very steeply dipping. They're almost uh, upright. Uh, these, uh, the quartzites were actually part of a beach on the ocean uh, half a billion years ago. And over time, the sand was compressed and metamorphosed into quartzite. So they're, for the most part, almost 100% silicon dioxide. Silica, which is uh, the same thing uh, that sand is 100% uh, silica. This is the uh, Hamel, also known as the Ardsley Quarry in Abington Township. When I first uh, read about the quarry during my research, it said um, the quarry was 75 feet deep. So I went out there and the quarry property is now occupied by a VFW and it's flat and pretty much street level. Um, the only parts of the quarry you could see were just this very upper part along the edge of the parking lot. And I thought, wow, that must have been a heck of a hole that they had to fill here. But looking at this picture, you could see that the whole quarry wasn't 75 feet deep. It was just certain beds uh, that they found uh, to be the best for uh, furnace linings that they would mine. They just follow the bedding um, all the way down. These are derricks uh, here that were used to lift the stone um, out of the quarry holes. Uh, and Talking to a, a friend of mine who lives in the area, he said that they recently started filling in this area so now that even the top, the very top of the quarry walls are no longer visible. Part of, part of the effects of urbanization, um, these sites just kind of disappear. Uh, one of the reasons is the land is so valuable in Montgomery County. Um, you can't have an open hole, you have to fill it and build on it. So a lot of the old quarries and a lot of the old mines, they get filled uh, built over and uh, the history is lost. People don't know that they were ever there. You go here today, you see the VFW in its parking lot. You would never realize that there was a uh, quartzite mining operation uh, back a hundred years ago. One of the minerals uh, that were produced uh, from the quartzites in this area is hematite, a uh, really nice shiny crystal of it here. Uh, I did analyze some of this and it was several percent titanium um, by weight, um, which is uh, interesting. Uh, most hematite does not contain any titanium um, whatsoever. Montgomery County was a major producer of asbestos products back in the day. There were major manufacturing facilities in Ambler, Norristown, Port Kennedy, uh, near Lansdale, and in fact, Ambler was once known as the asbestos capital of the world. Um, one of the big products was asbestos insulation and that was produced from a mixture of 85% magnesia and 15% asbestos. Uh, the magnesia was produced from locally mined um, high magnesium dolomites and all the asbestos was imported. Most of it came from Canada and uh, some of it came from Arizona. This is one of the companies that operated in uh, Norristown. Uh, this one was located on Washington Street below Ford Street. 
Uh, it manufactured insulated coverings for steam and hot water pipes. Um, if you've been to maybe some old buildings, uh, you'll notice the uh, pipes encased in, the, uh, in this white covering stuff. Well, that was uh, the magnesium or the asbestos uh, insulation that they used to use on pipes. About 75 men were employed by this plant. In 1914, the Pennsylvania Department of Health estimated that the, this company discharged 25,000 gallons of asbestos contaminated waste directly into the Schuylkill River every day. Uh, back then, asbestos was not considered hazardous. Uh, people would handle it with their bare hands. Um, particles would fly all over the place in some of these manufacturing uh, uh, places. Uh, they had no idea that it was, uh, was dangerous. This is the man that started the asbestos industry, uh, Richard Madison. Um, he attended the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and then earned a degree in uh, medicine from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. However, he never practiced medicine. He had a little laboratory uh, that he tinkered around with. He produced some patent uh, medicines, curatives, uh, some of which uh, <laughs> contained high doses of caffeine uh, to get you going, keep you alert. And um, he discovered uh, that a mixture of magnesium carbonate or magnesia uh, and asbestos uh, could be turned into an insulation material for, students, for steam pipes. So he started a company, Keesby and Madison, um, and started producing asbestos products. Keesby uh, was the silent business partner. Uh, Madison had the techniques and the, the information and the know-how to manufacture this stuff. And Keesby had the money to finance the, uh, the company. Uh, it was absolutely huge uh, back in its day. Here's a picture of it from uh, 1901. Uh, you can see a, just an absolutely humongous uh, industrial complex. Um, the rail yard here allowed them to bring in asbestos and ship out uh, finished asbestos products. Uh, Madison became a very wealthy man. Um, He's very generous. Uh, he helped build many of the, the uh, public buildings in Ambler. Um, he also built uh, many of the homes in Ambler. This is the Eret Magnesia Company plant and quarry in Valley Forge National Park in 1924. Uh, it was an operating um, asbestos manufacturing company. They got the magnesia from their own quarry uh, right here on site. Uh, this company started uh, about 1900 and um, lasted until um, about 1970-something, uh, um, when it was shut down, uh, the National Park Service acquired the property. And um, uh, the probably the worst part of this is that in its endeavor to erase everything in the area that was post-revolutionary war, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania allowed this company to pump asbestos waste into the nearby quarries in order to fill up the quarries and make them disappear. And that led uh, to this area becoming a Superfund site. So if you walk down a county line road, uh, you'll see orange fences and you'll see a bunch of these signs. Uh, and they've been working on a cleanup for a, uh, a number of years here. This is one of the asbestos companies that operated in uh, Plymouth Meeting. Uh, Johns Manville was another one of the big companies. Um, I'm sure you've heard of them that operated an asbestos plant in a magnesia quarry. Um, but this particular one, um, particular company purchased the quarries of uh, Lewis Graver, um, who operated a lime business for many, many years. And um, said they were going to build a big plant and, and uh, create a big business um, and they sold a lot of stock. 
Uh, the president of the company here, John Qualey, uh, was a swindler and a con man. Uh, most of his work was based in uh, Arizona. Um, he was arrested there for swindling several times. Uh, he moved east. Uh, we, his specialty was selling fake Arizona mining company stocks to investors in the east. Uh, but then he moved east and he started a whole bunch of fake um, asbestos companies. And um, they estimate he probably sold about $2 million in fake uh, stocks over the course of his, um, his lifetime. Um, however, in 1910, he was arrested. Uh, he and his uh, partner, um, Harvey Corbett were arrested in New York for swindling a widow out of her $35,000 life savings by selling her stock in a fake magnesia company. Uh, Mr. Corbett here was sitting in his jail cell pondering the rest of his life when he decided to turn state wit state's uh, witness and um, spill the beans on Qualey. Uh, and he did that and Qualey got eight years in prison for his efforts. Uh, and again, this company right here was located in uh, Plymouth Meeting. The property was bought by the uh, Phillips Carey Company um, afterwards, and they manufactured asbestos products uh, probably into the 1960s. Uh, building stone was always a big industry in Montgomery County. Uh, there were a number of different stones that were uh, quarried there. Marble, limestone, diabase, which is also known as granite or black granite, quartzite, schist, gneiss, and sandstone. Some of the sandstone uh, is known as brownstone that came from the Stockton Formation and was used for uh, house and building construction. Uh, crushed stone, which is the, um, the only industry that really survives today. And also there was a paving block industry. Uh, these were known as Belgian blocks. Uh, they were all made from diabase uh, from the northern part of the, um, the county. And before the advent of Macadam, they were very popular for paving streets. Uh, millions of paving blocks um, paved the streets of Philadelphia uh, back in the day. And the, um, the diabase blocks were favored above all other kinds of rocks. A diabase is probably the hardest rock in eastern Pennsylvania. And uh, it's very, very durable. Um, uh, as I pointed out in the geology uh, map, it was squeezed in between the layers of the sedimentary rock. It never made it to the land surface. So it was squeezed in between the layers as molten lava and slowly cooled over thousands of years. But since it's a tough, tough rock, all of the local rocks around it eroded away. The diabase did not. So it's on the surface today. In fact, it's um, a hill former. It's generally wooded because you can't farm it. It's too rocky. And uh, there are many state game lands located on the diabase. And this was the preferred uh, material for paving stones because it didn't wear smooth. It would always uh, retain a rough surface, uh, which was important for horses and uh, carts and that kind of thing when it was wet or snowy um, and the blocks got, um, uh, if they were smooth, would get very slippery. West Concha, East Conchahawken had a very large quarry um, that supplied building stone, uh, generally used for foundations, uh, a lot of bridge work, a lot of railroad bridge work. And this is one of the railroad bridges uh, over the Wissagan Creek that was built with stone from the uh, East Conchahawken Quarry in 1885. Down in the southern part of the, uh, the county, uh, the area that was uh, green on the geological map, uh, some very old crystalline rocks down there, and they produced a lot of building stone. This is the Beth Ayers Quarry. Uh, this quarry and a nearby quarry produced all the building stone to build the Bryn Athen Cathedral uh, down in Bryn Athen. Uh, this is Richard Madison's mansion known as Lindwald Castle. It was built with um, stone from the Madison Quarry, which was located on his uh, estate. Uh, this quarry um, 
This quarry also had, um, had, they called it springs, but it was really groundwater infiltration into the quarry. And instead of pumping it out, they piped it out and uh, called it the Ambler Spring Water Company and supplied 360,000 gallons of water per day from the, uh, this quarry to the local uh, residents. Um, Madison used stone from his quarry to construct many uh, of the prominent buildings in Ambler and, and many houses. Uh, this is one of them, uh, the Trinity Memorial Church that was constructed of uh, stone from uh, Madison's quarry. There was one large quarry in Springfield Township called the um, Orland Crush Stone Quarry. It was opened in the late 1800s by William Wilson. In 1932, the quarry was taken over by Nicholas Cassetti and it became uh, known as the Cassetti Quarry. Uh, it operated under the name of the Orland Crush Stone uh, Company Quarry. Um, you can see here that um, power shovels were used to scoop up the stone. They went through a primary crusher here at the bottom of the quarry, up a conveyor belt, and to the uh, secondary crusher up on the uh, top of the quarry. This is another view of, view of it, uh, the primary crusher down here, the conveyor belts taking the rock up out of the quarry to the uh, secondary crusher. Well, let me go back. Um, so this was a nice operating uh, quarry until 1958. A snowstorm knocked out the power uh, to the area. No power, no pumps, couldn't pump the water out. The quarry flooded. And a lot of times these big quarries, once they flood, you just can't pump them out. There's just way too much water um, to handle. So they couldn't pump the quarry out. They abandoned it. Um, and as Scott mentioned earlier, uh, it was acquired by the Navy. Uh, from the uh, former Naval Air Warfare Center in Warminster, uh, where I had a project for 20 years, so I know that area pretty well. Um, they used it for submarine research. Eventually, they uh, gave it up. The township, ac township acquired it, and it is the lake uh, that is in Sandy Run Park. So this is what the Sandy Run Park lake looks like if it had no water in it. Probably the largest crushed stone quarry is the Perky Omenville uh, Quarry, also known as the uh, Kibble House Quarry in uh, Marlboro Township. Uh, this used to be a favorite place for mineral collectors and uh, it was a mom and pop operation for years and it was only down two levels. It was down here for years and years and years and then a uh, large company purchased it and uh, uh, really um, deepened it and took out quite a lot of stone. In Green Lane, there were three quarries that operated for building stone and crushed stone. Um, this is a picture of the Hancock Stone Quarry. Uh, right here is Perky Omen Creek, uh, directly in front of it. It's called the Hancock Quarry, but Hancock never quarried any rock. Hancock was known as the Ice King of Philadelphia. Uh, his business was selling ice. Uh, and this was, of course, in the days before refrigeration. He built a very large ice house um, near here on this piece of property, and he would cut ice on Perky Omen Creek uh, in the wintertime and store it in his ice house. Uh, sparks from a passing train caught the ice house on fire, it burned to the ground, and uh, one, of, one of the subs, uh, subsequent owners decided to erect a crusher, uh, which the remains are, I guess, a <laughs> This was operational uh, back in 1911 here and uh, started quarrying the stone. The, the quarry looks a lot like it does today. Today it uh, looks a lot like it does in this picture. It hasn't really uh, changed much. It was never developed into a very uh, large quarry. Uh, this is a picture from one of the green lane quarries and, and I like this picture so much I decided to use it on the cover of my book. Um, see all the quarry workers here, the crusher plant, and just by looking at them, you can easily guess uh, which one of them is the quarry boss. Guy here over on the right-hand side. If you take Route 202 out of King of Prussia towards Norristown through Bridgeport, 
uh, just before you get to the bridge over the Schuylkill River on the right hand side is the Bridgeport Quarry. Um, probably just see a fence around it unless you uh, stop and try and uh, peer through uh, the fence. Uh, this quarry was started in the 1800s um, by a guy by the name of McGinnis who operated a lime business. So he had a small quarry, uh, burnt lime and uh, sold it. It was uh, eventually acquired by the Bethlehem Steel Company. Uh, they quarried the stone for use as flux in their iron furnaces. And um, by 1967, they had quarried out to the limits of their property and um, quarried down as far as they could and they could no longer get any stone out of it. So they sold it to the Philadelphia Suburban Com Water Company. Uh, they abandoned it, let it flood. So you had this very large hole full of water. The Philadelphia Suburban Water Company, which is known as Aqua Pennsylvania today, uh, put it into uh, use as a reservoir. So today it's called the Upper Marion Reservoir. Uh, it's really just a large limestone quarry that's been flooded. Uh, the storage capacity of the quarry is 750 million gallons and it's, uh, they're permitted to withdraw 7.2 million gallons of water per day from this flooded quarry to supply the uh, local residents. Uh, this is one of the quarries in um, the diabase. A lot of times uh, when they quarry the diabase, they just work the surface boulders or sometimes just some very solid ledges of uh, stone. They didn't have an actual formal uh, quarry. And they drilled holes uh, with um, a drill and a sledgehammer, series of holes. They put the feather and plug wedges in it, wedged the stone apart. And then with smaller hammers, uh, like this one, uh, broke the stone down into smaller blocks. So you can see the finished blocks, uh, the diabase um, over here. And um, same material that was used to make the Belgian uh, paving blocks. Lead ore was mined in Montgomery County from 1804 to 1825. It was mined from the Wetherill Mine on the Millgrove Estate in Audubon. It's the only uh, mine in Montgomery County that produced lead ore. Uh, this is a piece of lead ore, uh, Galena, uh, from the Wetherill Mine. Uh, mining took place in Audubon from 1804 to 1825. And then there was a several decades when no mining took place. Uh, and then they started mining again uh, for copper. Uh, there were many places that copper was mined um, in Montgomery County. It was all found in the Brunswick Formation. These mines are Deposits consisted of localized mineralized zones in shale. They were not true ore bodies. Uh, the result being people would see these uh, thick coatings of copper minerals. They would think they had a bonanza. They would uh, sell stock, uh, dig a hole, and um, shortly find out there wasn't really that much of this stuff and it wasn't that pure and it wasn't that valuable and go bankrupt. Um, if they had a competent geologist looking at some of these, these deposits, a lot of these uh, company failures could have been avoided. The only really successful uh, copper mines were on the Milgrove Estate um, in Audubon. Uh, this is a stock certificate from one of them, the Pennsylvania Copper Mining Company. Uh, they were located on the Blind Farm near Pottstown. And uh, again, they found some copper mineralization. They decided to uh, sell stock. Uh, they started mining the copper ore. This company even erected a smelter uh, to smelt the ore into uh, copper. Uh, the smelter never ran. The ore, <laughs> the ore was not plentiful, uh, was not rich enough. And uh, eventually they couldn't pay the rent and Frank Blime kicked them off uh, his farm and sold all their equipment. Um, to recoup uh, the back rent. Uh, this is another one, the Congo Copper Company at the Brendlinger Mine. Uh, this mine was uh, 
known probably around or before the Revolutionary War. And again, one of these spotty copper deposits. Uh, the mine was resurrected about every 30 or 40 years. Someone would go in there and uh, sink a shaft, start mining, uh, quickly go bankrupt. Uh, the last mining took place during World War I um, when it was operated by the Congo Copper Company. Uh, they supposedly shipped a carload of ore to New York City for assay, uh, but they never actually produced any ore for sale. If you look at Skull's 1759 map, it shows two copper mines. This one here, which is labeled as the uh, Caledonia Copper Mine, uh, that one's been lost to history. Nobody really knows anything about it. They don't even know where it actually was. It was probably just a prospect. Uh, someone dug a small hole in a hillside, found some copper uh, mineralization. Uh, it was probably never more than that. The other one down here, which is just outside of Schwenksville, uh, it's labeled as copper mine, is uh, called the Old Perkyoman Copper Mine. And that was known, uh, it was the first copper mine in Pennsylvania. It was probably known as early as the late uh, 1600s. Uh, this is an advertisement um, in the Philadelphia Gazette from 1772 uh, offering the land uh, for sale, uh, 470 acre copper mine track. And uh, again, the mining here is very sporadic. Um, companies did not make money because there really wasn't that much uh, ore available. Um, one of the companies did sink three shafts and run a drainage tunnel uh, from their shafts out to the creek. And this is a picture of what the inside of the uh, tunnel looks like, uh, hewn through solid uh, sandstone. The last company that operated this mine was the Schwenksville Mining Company, and they operated it during World War I. Uh, they did not produce any ore, but they succeeded in selling a, a lot of uh, stock. This is a piece of native copper from the old Perky Omen uh, mine. Native copper is elemental copper. This is pure copper that's found in nature. It's not combined with um, any other elements uh, to form a mineral. Um, so it's called a native element. On the Mill Grove property is where you find the Audubon lead copper mines. Uh, the mining began at the Wetherill mine in 1804 when the Audubon family owned the property. Um, <laughs> what's always interesting to me is it's called the Audubon estate and the Audubon bird sanctuary and its entire history of ownership, the Audubon family only owned it for two years. And, um, they acquired it in 1804 is when the uh, lead deposit was uh, located. Most of the mining took place from 1848 through 1854 and they were uh, copper mines. Uh, the mines consist of four main shafts um, on or near the Mill Grove property. The Ecton Consolidated Mining Company was organized in 1847, and the Perkyoman Mining Association was formed in January of 1848. Uh, these two companies were merged in 1851 to form the Perkyoman Consolidated Mining Company. The miners that worked in these mines came from Cornwall, England, and they had two rows of cottages um, on one side of the street were miners' cottages for the Ecton mine. On the other side of the street facing them were miner cottages for the uh, Perkyoman mine. And um, what's interesting is these miners were not actually employed by the mining companies. Uh, they were called what, uh, what's known as tributors. Uh, tributors often worked in groups and what they would do is uh, join together uh, and have an agreement with the mining company to extend the mining level so many feet or uh, work a stope for so many tons of ore. Uh, and they got paid with a percentage of the ore that they mined. 
And sometimes the groups would bid against each other for uh, contracts. Um, and although the miners weren't actually paid by the mining companies, this seemed to work out uh, to be beneficial for the miners. The um, company went bankrupt in 1854, and that was pretty much the end of mining. There was uh, some sporadic mining uh, as late as 1891 on the property. Uh, this is a uh, woodcut from 1850 uh, of what the mines looked like. It was rather a prosperous uh, uh, looking area. That's a cross section of the Perkyoman mine showing some of the shafts which are vertical, some of the levels which are horizontal here. And these dark areas are what's called stoped out areas. There's areas where the ore was rich enough to extract and uh, to sell. Uh, so you had two, two shafts, uh, the, the main uh, Perkyoman shaft here and what was called the uh, Perkyoman wind, wind shaft uh, that were joined by tunnels. Plans called to run all these levels over to this tunnel, but they went bankrupt before that ever happened. In 1893, uh, this is all that remained, uh, the, uh, per the Ecton mine. Uh, part of the building and the smokestack um, here. And today, if you go to the uh, Audubon Bird Sanctuary and hike the trails, uh, you will go right past the smokestack, which is the only remaining structure uh, from this mining enterprise of uh, 170 years ago. There is, facing Perkyoman Creek, a mine opening that's called the Ecton Mine 80 foot stope. And it's debatable whether this was a separate mine or whether it actually connected with the uh, Ecton Mine. Um, mineral collectors discovered it in the early 1950s. Uh, they went in it, they mapped it, they could not find a connection to the main um, Ecton Mine. Uh, I have a couple of pictures uh, from the 1950s of what it looked like inside this mine. Some of the timbers uh, that are propping up the uh, ceiling. Uh, you had to be kind of brave to go into this mine to collect minerals. Uh, the first thing you had to do is to uh, wade through chest deep cold water that was draining out of it. And uh, then you had to find your way in the pitch darkness to some areas of mineralization where you could actually collect the uh, minerals. Um, this is a picture from uh, 1955 uh, from Harold Evans' uh, copper mining um, book. The Ecton mine uh, and Perkyoman mine produced some very beautiful minerals, uh, beautiful orange wolfenite here, uh, which is a uh, molybdenum mineral, um, green pyromorphite, which is a uh, lead mineral. Uh, this is malachite, which was uh, one of the main ores uh, for copper that came out of the Perkyoman mine. And this is the mineral barite. Uh, the Perkyoman mine produced world-class barite specimens back in about um, 1850. And these are preserved at Union College as part of the Charles Wheatley uh, collection. Charles Wheatley was the mine manager for about a year um, in the Perkyoman mine. And then he uh, went off into Chester County, started his own uh, lead mine, uh, the Wheatley mine there. And a beautiful bright blue mineral, uh, lead mineral called linerite, uh, which you can find in the uh, 80 foot stope. Montgomery County has many, many buildings built of brick. Bricks were manufactured locally at many different locations um, in the county. Um, bricks are pretty heavy. Uh, it didn't, it was not cost effective to uh, ship them long distances. So most of the brick manufacturing uh, uh, clay pits and uh, brick companies were uh, fairly local. And the clay uh, came from weathered shale that was dug from uh, open pits. 
that they used to make the bricks. There was one large uh, brick plant, and that was the Montello Brickworks in uh, Upper Providence Township that operated in the early uh, 1900s. Uh, it's a picture from the outside and a picture from the inside showing the, um, the kiln cars that were loaded with uh, bricks. So it was quite a volume um, operation. Flory's Brickworks uh, was located in Roslyn, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, they became established in 1910, succeeding the Brickwork, the uh, bankrupt Abington uh, Brick Company. Uh, they lasted until 1948 when the Abington Township Board of Commissioners purchased the Brickworks and uh, it's in use as a public works um, plant today. Um, this is a beehive uh, lime kiln uh, that was operated at the Lansdale Brick Company in Upper Gwynedd Township. You see the piles of uh, bricks here on the property. They had a clay pit uh, back in here where they dug the clay to make the bricks. So anyway, um, everything I've talked about tonight is included in my book, uh, The Mines and Minerals of Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's available from Amazon.com. Uh, you just have to get on there and uh, put my name in, um, S-L-O-T-O, and uh, these books should show up. I uh, also have a similar effort for Chester County and a similar effort for um, Berks County. And I'd like to um, point out, <clears throat> uh, these make perfect Christmas presents for all your friends and relatives. Uh, so that concludes my presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ron. I, I really appreciate it. I, I found that in very interesting. Uh, we did have a couple of questions. Um, and we'll see if we can pull those up here. Okay. Um, so we'll start at the, at the, the first question we had. Um, and it was uh, a question about the pig iron. Um, somebody wanted to know what, uh, what, what is pig iron? All right, pig iron is, um, take your iron furnace, which is basically a smelter. You add your iron ore, uh, your fuel, which at that point in Montgomery County was um, anthracite coal, and you add a little bit of limestone as flux. Uh, you heat it up and uh, you drive the oxygen out of your iron oxide, your iron ore is, is all iron oxide. You drive off the oxygen and that leaves you with metal iron, which drops to the bottom of the furnace. Um, you open up the uh, hatch, the iron pours out. And uh, back in the day, um, they dug channels in the uh, dirt floor of the um, iron smelter. And uh, so you had your main channel and small channels that branched off, and at the end of each channel was uh, kind of a, a little dugout area that the iron flowed into and um, solidified. And then you could just break those pieces of, of iron off and uh, stack them up and send them out uh, for processing. And because this looked like uh, little piglets uh, at the mother pig, uh, it got the name pig iron. So that's where that comes from. Right. Okay. Um, are there are any of the mines in Conshohocken, Plymouth, or Bridgeport still accessible today? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> most of them have been filled in uh, and built over. Um, and there's, there's the odd iron pit here and there that's overgrown that, that's probably not recognizable as an old uh, iron pit unless you get down in it and poke around. Um, I know there's a, there's a super fun site um, located there, he the Henry, Henry Kessler uh, super fun site uh, where they disposed a lot of uh, toxic waste in uh, some of the old quarry and mine holes. And um, they did an intensive survey of that property and they did find uh, two iron pits in a small um, uh, marble quarry. But um, for the most part, they're all gone. Uh, you, 
you can't really um, access uh, access them. Yeah. Um, are there any other Montgomery County marble buildings in Center City? You you had mentioned uh, Gerard College uh, or found Founders Hall at Gerard College. Um, um, I haven't I haven't listed in my book. I don't remember remember them all off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. the, the ones that I know for definite sure made of Montgomery County marble, I have them listed um, under uh, either the quarries in White Marsh or the quarries in um, Upper Marion Township. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think I can add uh, to the, you had mentioned Founders Hall and the Second Bank, um, uh, the Merchants Exchange building. Mm -hmm. Uh, is also uh, Pennsylvania blue marble, um, and I think uh, the first bank might also be, um, if I'm not mistaken. And, and the mint may be too, also. The um, U.S. mint in the, Philadelphia. The current, the current U.S. mint, or the. <laughs> <laughs> that may be the old exactly. U.S. Which mint. I, think, I don't I really know the history fourth, of the mint. I think is actually the fourth, the fourth mint building, um, but. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, we'll look to your book for the uh, for that list. Um, okay, what was the lime used for? Uh, mostly agriculture uh, for farm fields. Uh, before the advent of commercial fertilizers, it was in huge demand. Uh, some of it went uh, to make mortar building lime. Um, in fact, Independence Hall, uh, when that was being built, uh, the designers called for um, lime from White Marsh Township and only lime from White Marsh Township to be used to make the mortar to build Independence Hall. Uh, so it was, it was uh, favored for those two um, uses. Interesting. Okay. Um, is the chemistry of the ore similar to hematite and uh, taconite uh, that, that, that uh, Christine is familiar with. Um, so is the chemistry of the ore uh, similar to hematite and taconite? Uh, all the ores were either iron oxides or iron hydroxides, uh, pretty much. Uh, the hematite, I showed a picture of the hematite, uh, that was never used as an iron ore. Um, that's just an accessory mineral that was found in the uh, Chickie's Quartz site and is of interest to mineral collectors. Uh, because of the high titanium content, it probably would have made a rather lousy iron ore. Mm. Okay. Um, let's see. And then uh, uh, we have several uh, thank yous uh, for, for an interesting presentation. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, we have somebody uh, who already owns the book and highly recommends it if you're into mineral collecting. Um, and another comment um, from Charlie, who says, uh, I've seen the marble mantles of several 1700s houses identified as King of Prussia marble, uh, the, gray, the gray with some white in it. That would be from the Schweier and Lease Quarry, uh, which was located just outside of uh, King of Prussia. Prussia, okay. Um, was there any lime or brick production in Fort Washington in the vicinity of uh, McGurk's? I know in Fort Washington there were at least three brownstone quarries that produced building stone, um, but I'm not aware of a lime operation in Fort Washington. Okay. Uh, that was up in, uh, the, most of the lime operations were in the uh, limestone, the uh, uh, White Marsh Valley, and Fort Washington is up into the uh, Triassic Red Rocks. Okay. Um, uh, Monica, thanks you for the explanation on pig iron. Um, and then uh, another question here, are there any good places to dig quartz crystals in Monaco? <laughs> uh, the King of Prussia area uh, has produced some amazing quartz crystals. Um, I used to know a really good place to uh, dig them. 
uh, but they reconfigured the uh, railroad line and all the roads and they completely changed the landscape. And uh, when I went back there several years later, I just couldn't find the spot. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, King of Prussia is uh, that area. Um, if you look in uh, gullies and washouts and stream beds uh, is a good place to look. You can find uh, some really nice quartz crystals. I think the largest one uh, they ever found weighed 12 pounds. Wow. Um, uh, one more question here. What about mining of Wissahickon Schist? That would be for building stone. And there was um, in Lower Marion Township, I think uh, along Rock Run Road, something like that. Um, it's in my book. There was a string of quarries uh, that, pr that uh, produced building stone for years and years and years. Um, and they used, they used that for a lot of buildings in the uh, Philadelphia suburbs. Very popular building uh, stone. Yeah, certainly. Um, and the, uh, the Madison uh, asbestos plant, where, where was that located? Um, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing left of that huge structure, I would imagine. No, that, that structure is long gone, uh, but there's a couple of uh, uh, EPA hazardous waste sites um, on the uh, dumping areas okay. um, where they used to dump all the asbestos waste. Where, where in the proximity, where in the, do you know where uh, in Ambler or close to Ambler it was? Um, if you get on the EPA's website and go to the hazardous waste section, they <laughs> have a whole page dedicated to it with all kinds of stuff. And right. we'll probably have a map and the addresses off the top of my head, I don't know. Uh, but I have a friend that grew up in that area and he talked about uh, kids sledding down the uh, asbestos piles when they were kids. Mountains, the, the White Mountains of Ambler that uh, Charlie uh, tells us here. It's, yeah. it's, uh, I think that's what he's referring to probably is the sledding, sledding hill. Um, okay. All right. And another thank you there uh, from Susan. Um, so, um, again, I, I'd like to, uh, to thank you very much for, for your presentation this evening. Um, glad, could, glad you could join us and glad all the participants uh, uh, stayed with us. Um, and uh, I thought it was very interesting and I uh, encourage everybody to uh, uh, to go get your book on amazon.com um, and, and the others as well for the other uh, counties. And uh, you mentioned you're also working on uh, a similar study for Bucks County. Yes, uh, right. Hopefully when uh, uh, sites are accessible again and you can get your research going, we'll look for that one as well. Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Ron, and uh, have a great you're evening, welcome. everybody. Um, and uh, again, look to our social media for, uh, for the next events coming up for the Springfield Township Historical Society. We'll be happy to uh, see you again. Okay, have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. All right, good night.